about all the questions that I didn't answer very well because, you know, that's what you do with your... That's to be something impromptu. You resync it all. But anyway, one of the questions I think I didn't thoroughly answer was such a good one. It was just such a practical question about what do you do during your time with the Lord, during quiet time. So I just wanted to revisit that for a second and tell you that um, this year I discovered um, Daily Grace uh, resources and I've been loving those Bible studies. So if you're looking for a good Bible study and they look pretty, but they, they've been not as resources too, but Daily Grace, I'm, I'm loving it, um, the Bible study. So I wanted to mention that. And then also, um, something, a practice that I started, and I haven't been doing it lately, but I wanted to share, um, that I got from reading St. John Piper. I, I love reading John Piper, and uh, just wanted to share this with you. Um, maybe, maybe, where is it? Um, pray for at least four verses before you dive into the Word. Because sometimes we come to God's Word and we're we're um, kind of hold, or we're not really teachable, or our minds are something else. And so praying um, one or even all four of these verses before we dive in, it's just, we're just asking the Lord to help us. We're asking the Holy Spirit to help us understand and, and glean from the word. But here they are. And it's easy to remember, I owe you, their I will use. And the first one we give them, I owe you apps, okay? So... Psalm, if you want to write these down, Psalm 1, 1936. Is your eye inclined my heart to you? And then Psalm 119, 18 is the O. Open my eye to behold wonderful things in your word. What a beautiful thing to pray before you read God's word. Open my eyes to behold the wonderful things in your word. And then the view is from Psalm 86, 11. Unite my heart to fear your name, that our heart would be um, all in as we read God's word and we seek to obey him. And then the S is from Psalm 90, 14. Satisfy me with your steadfast love. So just a PS to one of the, the questions this morning. Um, and I can't remember who asked it, but it's such a question that I hope that a little more practical advice for you. There you go. Um, okay, so we're going to continue. We're going to delve into God's word and particularly um, in Acts. We were in Acts last night, but we're going to be in Acts again. Uh, and we're going to think about last night, you talked about the fact that God, that this community is in the Trinity. And that our God is such a relational God that, of course, if we're made in an image, it's just, it's just a fact that we also are relational. That he made us for relational in relationship with him, but he made us for relationship with one another as well. And in order um, to do relationships well, we have to, we have to understand a little bit of who we are, what our own identity is, and, and the people that we're in relationship with. And... So I was thinking about times in my life to like questions, who am I? I remember a story when I was about 10 years old. I was a little girl. My dad came from a big family and often all the aunts and uncles would gather together and talk about family. And I remember laying in bed and listening to them talk about my great grandfather. And they didn't call him by any warm title. They called him Old Man Haskell. And he was a gnarly old guy. And he lived in a one-room shack in Connecticut where it was cold with no electricity and no running water. And one day a birth burned down. And so my dad and his brothers went and they rebuilt it. And then when they were going out there to, his, to the land, this Native American land that he lived on, that's, my, that's part of my background, um, they brought some of us kids to show us this, this they, you know, that the uncle had built this new little house for my great grandfather. And, uh, and I never met him before, but I heard stories about him. So I was kind of afraid of him. And I walked up to him and I said, I was 10. Hi, Grandpa. He just was big and smelly and hairy and mean. And he just looked at me and said, Who the hell are you? He said, It's dudes. Yeah. I mean, he can come and laugh. 
but it's kind of sad. This thing, kind of sad. And at the time, I was afraid. And I don't know what answer I had from him. I probably ran away. But I will tell you something. I had asked myself that question so many times. Was that the HVLL win there? But Donna, who are you? Who are you to teach a Joshua? Who are, who are you to work at Biola? Who are you? All the questions, all the nagging things that we can second guess ourselves and we can wonder who are we really? Especially when things are going well, but even sometimes when I'm going poorly. Why? What's this happening to me? Well, as I said, I've probably heard this uh, a thousand times, and I want us to think about um, a couple men in Acts who had to dig down deep and answer this question for themselves. Do you, do you know Ananias in Acts 9 to the X9? I love his little story. I told you this morning that I love Paul's letters because I'm so intrigued by Paul and his story. I can't wait to meet him in heaven. And here in Acts 9, we get a little glimpse into Paul's life a really important moment in Paul's life and a really important moment in Ananias' of life. All we know about Ananias is that he's living in the first century Damascus and he was a new Christian. And all of that brought a lot of trouble into his life. He probably was rejected from his work and his family and his community because he was a new Christian, and he was very aware that other Christians were fleeing from Jerusalem because of the fear that they had from this man named Saul. They were fleeing. This zealous Pharisee who persecuted Christians, he was very aware of that. And they were fleeing to his little town. And he had, um, he, Aaron I, he had known that Paul had witnessed and approved the stoning of Stephen. He was against Christians, and he was moving around now from place to place, Paul was, Saul was. He was powerful, and he had the authority of the chief priest to go and seek out Christians and to silence them once and for all. And so Ananias and the other believers in his town would have probably been worshiping a secret, hoping to not be discovered by this this persecutor named Saul. Because Ananias himself would have been a potential victim. And so Acts 9, he tells us that uh, Saul was still, I think in verse 1, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. And he went to the high priest and he asked the high priest for letters to the synagogues at Damascus so that if any were found belonging to the way, it says men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So this was Saul's errand. But remember what happens on the road to Damascus. What happens to Paul, us to Saul on the road to Damascus? The idiot Hector? Yes, he's knocked down by a bright light. Right? And he hears a voice. And what does it say to what does the voice say to him? Saul Saul, why are you persecuting me? Yes. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And how does Saul respond? Lord. Yes, who are you? And he says, I am Jesus, who you are persecuting. And Jesus tells him to go to Damascus and wait for further instructions. And for three days, Saul is there without sight without food and without jury. So let's pick this up in, in verse 10. And it says, Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying, and she has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, 
Lord, I have heard many things about this man, how much evil he has done against your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for she is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. And then he rose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. So, what a contrast between Saul is not to the ground, just a voice and say, it says, who are you? Ananias hears Jesus speak to him and says, here I am, Lord. Right? Opposite responses, just a few verses apart that we see. And Jesus asked Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul says, yeah, who are you? Saul knew to be told who he was. Ananias knew who he was. He knew who was calling his name. And we, he was already, we saw him. He was called a disciple. He was, he provided to Judas. He knew when Jesus was calling his name. He knew his voice. And he responded like a true follower would. He said, hearing him, I know your voice and, and I know my relationship with you. You're for Lord, I'm available. And Jesus says to him, rise and go to the street called Street and look for the man of Tarsus named Saul. The one who Ananias would have been so afraid of. And so in verse 13, Ananias says to Jesus, Lord, I have heard from many about him. He didn't have personal experience of Saul yet, but he heard the stories and he knew his brothers and sisters in Christ were fleeing, fleeing their homes because of him. But he knew from the stories that it was enough to hesitate, right? We see him hesitate. He voices his concerns to the Lord. It's as if he said, I know too much. I know too much about this man. He's done evil to your sin, Lord. Surely you don't want him to do evil to me too. Well, I'm see, Ananias is probably thinking. Well, at this point, I'm... And Ananias is probably hoping that Jesus would promise him protection from Saul. And say, don't worry. And yes, I'm asking you to go on this errand, but don't worry, nothing will happen to you. He doesn't say that to him, does he? Again, try, try to put yourself in this setting. Try to imagine what it would be like. Jesus is asking you to do an errand, to, to do a job for him. That means you're going to go and interact with somebody who you have a lot of reason to be fearful of. But the Lord says to him, go, for he's a chosen instrument of mine, carry my name for the Gentiles and King and the children of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So he doesn't promise Ananias that he'll be safe. But Ananias is assured that there's a large purpose, right? There's a purpose beyond Ananias that's little world that Saul is being called to. Okay. So it may be that Saul would have an evil against him. He doesn't know, but he's willing to accept this errand that Jesus is calling him to so that God's name might be proclaimed among the Gentiles. But he had a choice, didn't he? So what, what does this tell us in verse 17? What choice did he make? Yeah. It says, so what? And Mr. Fruit. Yeah, so Ananias departed. In other words, because he was told to, he departed. Okay, what do you think he would have done? So, uh, hold the Jonas. Uh, um, uh, hold his name. Say Jonas. Yeah, hopefully we've got you hope, right? We hope that you would be best. Obedient. Yeah, I do imagine myself saying, well, I need the keep days to pray about it. I need to talk to my husband. 
I need to read a book about it first because that's what I always want to do is read a book about it before I say yes to anything. Um, but it, it just says, so he departed. It says this, he's just, okay, gone. I'm obeying. We don't know how long it took for him, but I find this astounding. He had a lot of reason to fear, but it says, so he departed. He could have been asked in all the questions, who am I to undertake this errand for the Lord? Who am I to be the Lord's spokesperson? I don't really want to die. I don't want to be dragged back to Jerusalem. I want to continue with my quiet life here, just minding my own business, or Spain in secret. So departing, Ananias' departure took great faith, didn't it? And he was probably having to battle all of those who are you question the whole way to the street called straight. But then it tells us he entered the house and inside he finds Saul, a man who must have seemed so small compared to the monster that he had heard about. Because what, what do we know about him? What has he been doing for three days? Now I did the rating, and what else? Why? So, not a big, strong, you know, I've come in to make the world right. I've come in Damascus to take up all these Christ followers away and drag them back to Jerusalem. But we weakened, right? Probably, what else? Besides physically, we, what else do you imagine? Saul is experiencing at this point. Say it louder, sorry. Oh, is that you, JT? Hallucinations, yeah, it could be. Lack of food and drink. Yeah, what else? Fear. Yes. Confusion. Yeah, killed votes. And doubts. Yeah, perhaps. Scary, right? He's, he's at the mercy of someone who is cupping. He doesn't know who they are, right? And he's waiting. And he totally doesn't even know how much time has passed, right? Because he's in the dark. So he's waiting. He's broken. He's humbled. He's blinded, struck down. He had been confronted on the road. And he's no longer a tyrant causing fear, the, the persecutor had become impotent. And he's desperate. This influential leader had to be led by the hand to this house on the street called Straight. He couldn't even find his own way where he waited for three days. He was waiting and Jesus had told him, enter the city and you will be told what you are to do. So he just had to wait. They didn't know if they would tell her what to do or how long it would be. It was a dramatic conversion that at the time must have seemed, um, yeah, I think he was said to. There must have been some doubt. What have I gotten myself into? Three days earlier, it, was, it says, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, and now he's simply waiting humbly, desperately, following the Lord's orders. And in walks in the eyes. It's likely that Paul hadn't heard any words from the lips of a Christian since his conversion. It's likely that he, he was waiting in this house by himself since hearing the Lord's words, humble, hungry, weak, in the dark, literally and figuratively, and he hears someone walk in, and he doesn't know is this person raising a fist to him? Does this person have some similar weapon? What is the look on this person's face? He doesn't know, right, who this is that's entering this house. He hears somebody walk toward him. And verse 17 tells us about Ananias. Then laid his hands on him and sent Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road, by which you came? 
has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. The first word he holler, he brother. First word, brother. That is so profound. Ananias recognized Saul's deep physical and spiritual and emotional needs. He offered Saul friendly affection and touching him, but even more than friendly affection, it was familial commitment. Called him brother. And called David. And remember, Jesus didn't tell Ananias, go touch him and call him by. Right? Ananias, I think, was so driven by what he knew was theologically true that he could get past his fears, past his hesitations, past what is just kind of a natural repulsion from, from this persecutor and be driven by what is theologically true, which is that they were brothers in Christ. And he had to stake everything he had on the fact that conversion totally changed a person. Or should. It just flowed from what he believed theologically and from a heart of compassion. And surely the last three days for Saul had been spent in prayer and fasting and confession and regret over what he had done to the followers of Jesus. Surely Saul, Saul would have thought that Jesus would be justified in leaving him humbly blind after how he treated God's people. And surely Saul would have thought that, no, I just said that. Instead, had Jesus representative in Ananias came in and calls him brother. And I'm just trying to picture what that would be like. And I'm thinking tears must have flowed. Ananias must have had tears of joy over being Jesus' spokesperson, being firsthand this transformation in the fall. And Saul must have had tears over gratitude for this warm welcome that he received from Ananias. This, he was warmly welcomed into the whole family of God, communicated just with that word, brother. Truly, truly, Saul was experiencing amazing grace. He was welcomed into the family by one who had every right to hate him. But Ananias puts that all aside, right? Any right to revenge or self-righteousness or pity and instead he touches him and shows him this warmth and commitment as if conversion wasn't overwhelming enough for Saul and as if being welcomed into the family of God wasn't overwhelming enough for Saul and Laius tells him something even so even more incredibly wonderful and he says Jesus sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit Paul, Saul, would be empowered by the Holy Spirit. A gift so undeserved, and yet so necessary for what lie ahead for Saul. She had no idea that he was about to set world evangelism in place. So John, to think about the fact that how I am today as a Christian goes all the way back to Paul's faithfulness to wait for Ananias to come, to humble himself before the Lord so that the Holy Spirit would come upon him and to take on a ministry to the Gentiles of which we are a result all these generations later. Is that what we do want to just jump up and down and be excited? So yeah. Yes. Good. Thank you. And then what does it say? And immediately, something like scales fell off his eyes, and he regained his sight. So Vedatru experiences physical manifestation of the spiritual reality. Saul thought, prior to his experience of the Rose of Damascus, he thought 
he could see perfectly, not just with his sight, but he, he understood what was going on. He thought he could see the situation in the world for what it was. He thought he could see just fine, but actually he was spiritually blind. And then he was physically born. And then by the true light, he opened his eyes and Jesus allowed him to bring the light to the dark Gentile world. It's amazing. It's really amazing. And then it says he was he rose and he was baptized and taking food, he was strengthened. So Eli has continued to minister to Saul by baptizing him and by feeding him. And he was strengthened, I think, not just by the food, but by the fellowship by the hope for the future and by the sacrament of baptism. Imagine the strength that came with knowing that he was now not an orphan, but a beloved son. He belonged to a church comprised of other forgiven, righteous, adopted sons and daughters. He learned all that right away, right away in his interaction with Anna Knight. So Saul had a new answer to the question, who are you? Didn't he? His conversion meant that he went from zealous Pharisee and persecutor of the church to humble, grateful minister of the gospel. And I love this story because both Ananias and Saul, they had to let go of their answers to the question of who are you? And they had to let God change them. Ananias had simply be called a, a disciple and there was nothing special about her. We have never heard of him before and we don't hear him after in the Bible. And he's obscure. Probably his neighbors didn't even really know much about him. And yet his faithfulness to say yes to this task that the Lord gave him enabled him to be God's spokesperson. And it meant that the Gentiles would hear the good news of the gospel eventually through Paul's ministries. This tiny obedience, Ananias could not have known what it would set in place for the future. But Ananias went from fearful victim at the beginning of this chapter to disciple maker because he said yes to what Jesus asked him to do. So what if he had said no? What if he had said no? Or what if he found somebody else? And would you blame him for saying no what, to what seemed like a death sentence? He had to believe that his identity, his identity in Christ came at the trumpet. that he belonged to the Lord and he would do what the Lord told him to do. Well, I want to ask you, what, what would you do for obedience? Just think about that for a minute. Are you quick? Would you be quick to respond to the Lord if he asked you to do something that caused fear, but you had reason to to say, ah, oh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I want to do this. Sometimes I know I let my, my doubts about who I am to linger to one, and it keeps me from, from doing things that I think that the Lord wants me to walk into and say yes to. Um, but we have to believe that God can use our small acts of obedience. Sometimes they seem small, but we don't know what's on the other side of that. Do you believe he can use your small acts of faithfulness? I hope you do. Well, Saul also was given a new answer to the question of who are you? At the end of this three-day period that we get a glimpse of here in this chapter, Paul had a totally new answer to the question of who are you? No longer the zealous Pharisee. Now, I, th I think just a humble man wanting to do what the Lord asked him to do. So, 
it causes me to ask the question, have I did it up hope on anyone? I have people in my life that I've been talking to about Jesus for 40 years, the people I've been praying for for 40 years, who still say, don't talk to me about Jesus anymore. <laughs> I don't want to hear about that. But Saul would have been one of those people. Saul has been one of the people that we say, no, he would never come to Christ because she was so resolute and he was so committed to his, to his proven. But this, this little passage helps us realize that we can't give up hope on anyone. The people who seem the most cold and we can't imagine their transformation. He can't give up praying for them and ask to the Lord, is this the day that you want me to bring up Jesus again with these people? Do you know Saul, smart and powerful and resolute and cold to the gospel, or even someone doing evil to the saints? We know when we read our Bibles that God delights in transforming people or radically changing. In the Bible, we see uh, there's lots of different language that talks about the transformation that, that we see in different people, but from, from darkness to light or victim to minister or slave to free or orphan to son. And in the case of fall from enemy to brother. So God is all about changing him. And Saul could not have seemed like a more impossible case from a, from a human perspective. So I would encourage us have eyes to see radical transformation going on around you. And, and to name it. Sometimes I think it's hard to see our own growth. I had a, it can be really helpful if we have brothers and sisters in our lives and name it for us. That's one of my favorite things in my job at Biola is that I, I get the, you know, 18 year old high school grads who are coming into college. And I, when I was working full time there, I got to meet with them regularly for four years which means I got to see them grow up so much. And what I realized a long time is that they don't recognize their own growth. And it was such a joy for me to say, do you realize this is what you were like when you were 18 and this is where it's the faithfulness now. This is the thing you struggled with two years ago and look how you've had victory over it now. I want to encourage you guys to name those things for your friends. You, you're living with each other here. You instill those things. When we see somebody being obedient just in your everyday here somebody had a chance to gossip and they decided not to somebody who had a chance to break a policy and they decided not to me and say i saw that where you go way to be faithful way to be obedient way to hold your tongue way to honor our leaders way to defer to your roommate when they wanted the thing that you didn't want just encourage one another with those things. Name, name the faithfulness and note the transformation because it, it not only builds up the person that you're talking to, it builds us all up. It builds us up to notice that God's at work. God continues to be at work. I'm going to encourage you. Look for transformation. Have eyes. Ask God to give you eyes to see broken people. And then be love people enough to say it. And helps them. It helps. It's a way that we can help people know who they are. To answer that question: Who am I? But also, we need to tra- we need to celebrate the transformations in our own life, and that can be even harder to see growth in your own life. <laughs> Journaling is really helpful in this way, right? If, if any of you journal and you go back to even two years ago, you read to the fall. I am. I've grown since then. I'm not the same person I was. That should be so helpful. Abide. So I'd encourage you to, to somehow just keep track of what the Lord's doing in your life. Write it somewhere. Write a song about it. Write a poem about it. But just, just track what God is doing. The longer I live, the more thankful I am when I, I look back and I realize was the kinds of things that used to trip me up. And a lot of those things don't trip me up anymore. 
it's not like there aren't things that trip, trip me up, but I think in victory in some of those air shows. And what an, it will be drift to be able to remember God's faithfulness in that way. So to the question that my great grandfather asked me, which kind of makes us laugh, but is actually really sad. <laughs> I think I quietly looked up to him and I said, well, I'm, I'm Richie's daughter. Cause this old man had lots and lots of grandchildren and great grandchildren. And I was just trying to place myself within the family. So we had a little bit of context about who I was, but man, now in my own heart, on my own heart says, who am I? What is my identity? I don't know. I can quote scripture and say, in Christ, I am a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. I'm a child of God. And I hope that like Saul, like Ananias, that we can put our doubts aside and can know for sure who we are in Christ. Because that not only influences our relationship with King Lord, but all of our relationships with everybody else. Well, who we think we are, and what we believe about everybody else and and who they are. Okay, so I want to end with this quote. Oh, maybe I don't. Maybe I didn't bring it. Hold on. Oh, that. Hold that. Sorry. Okay, you know what? I'm going to save that tomorrow. With 7 3. Is it? Yes, yeah, it's 7 3. I'm going to pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you that you give us glimpses in so many ways of your transforming power. I thank you that you never leave us as we are when we come to you. That you make us more like Jesus over time. And I pray that the students will be encouraged to know that you are at work in them and the people around them. Lord, I pray that they would encourage one another and be faithful to you when you ask them to do things that we would all be faithful to sing yes to you and to be excited to see how you would use our small acts of faithfulness for your glory and for our good. We pray to in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.